He found us in our sin and covered us with his blood. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 2 today as we're in the early stages of making our way through this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. As we're thinking about it under the overarching theme, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. Corinth was an imperfect church, obviously so. But all of the New Testament churches up to this very day are imperfect churches because they're made up of sinners saved by grace. Not people who used to be sinners, but sinners saved by grace. And Paul is in the, in the midst of, in this section, he is really exhorting them to put away the divisive uh, factiousness that seems to be manifesting itself in the congregation in a way that is harming uh, their, their witness and their mission. It's important to remember that as we're reading through these things. He has not left his, his chiding of them about their choosing sides, and it'll become more obvious as we make our way to chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5 is what we're looking at today. Stand with me, if you would, as we read this. I hope you found it in your Bible, and if not, we have it on the screen for you. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us today to grow in our appreciation of the simple message of the gospel, Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, risen. It's glorious when we think about it. And it is the word, it is the message that has saved you if you've become a Christ follower here today. And it is the word that will save you if you're not yet a Christ follower. Thank you. Please be seated. He's talked previously about the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men and how God has made the wisdom of men foolishness because to, to people who think themselves wise, they think God's wisdom is foolishness. And Paul says it's really the other way around and, uh, and they're being set up for, for a big fall, a big surprise if they put their, their wisdom above God's wisdom. And so as he continues in that vein, what we see in the verses before us today, uh, just five things I want to call attention to. First of all, what preaching Christ crucified is not. Second, what preaching Christ crucified must be. Third, what preaching Christ crucified does not depend upon. Bad grammar, but I think it makes the point. What preaching Christ crucified does, not abso does absolutely depend upon. And then five, the goal of preaching Christ crucified. Let's, let's look at our text. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. In other words, what, what, is, what Christ crucified is not. This idea of when I came to you, I would remind you that he had gone through uh, some unhappy experiences prior to coming to Corinth. In fact, immediately prior to this, he had left Athens. And I want to read for you, just it's, a, it's about several verses, but I want to read for you from Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. I want you to hear 
what was going on, what went on in Athens. I want to explain to you why, why he says what he says here. In verse 16, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Athens, the seat of learning, the noblest of the nobles, the wisest of the wise. And it was a city full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So he's, he's provoked because everywhere he looks in Athens, there are idols. He goes to the synagogue where hopefully there's not idols there. The, the Jews were good monotheists. They, didn't, they were not supposed to craft idols. So he would, he would preach the gospel in the synagogues. He would go to the marketplace uh, in the same way, reasoning with them. In verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also uh, conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. So he's preaching the gospel to them. They identify him as a babbler and someone who's, who's brought in some foreign deity that they're not familiar with. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Areopagus was a place on Mars Hill, the gathering of the, of the brightest of the bright philosophers, religionists. They said, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. And by the way, they were, they were fascinated with, with the new. Just blown away by that which was new. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. <laughs> Think about what that's saying there. This was their pastime. Oh, so-and-so, he's got something new. Come, let's go listen to him. I've got something new I want to share. Oh, let's, let's hear it. So Paul, verse 22, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens... I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Watch what he's doing here now. He did not come to them and say, you bunch of heathen idolaters. I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. It's interesting. They, were, they imagined themselves to be so religious and so open that they even held out the possibility that there was a God they didn't know about, so they made an altar to the unknown God, covering all the bases. Because I want to proclaim this unknown God to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So this unknown God is the creator of heaven and earth. And he's not, he doesn't dwell in your temples. And he's not fashioned by you. In fact, you breathe because of the unknown God. And he made from one one man, every nation of mankind, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. He has set the bounds. This God is the sovereign creator. He's the sovereign life giver. You live where you live today by his sovereign pleasure. He set the bounds of your dwelling place. With this in mind, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For, and he quotes the, the, their own poets, in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So the poets, the, the 
Athenian poets would say, we are the offspring of the gods. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. He's pointing out their idols to them now. An image formed by the art and imagination of man. And he's, he's hitting on something here. You see, God made man in his own image. And since that day, men have been trying their best to make God in their own image. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men, all people everywhere to repent. So he's moved from God, this unknown God who is the creator of heaven and earth, the life giver, the sovereign determiner of where you live, who cannot be contained in idols, who's not made in the imagination of men. The times of ignorance God's overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere, pretty, pretty comprehensive there, all people in every place to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him, this man he's appointed, from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. Some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is what he's talking about. When he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And he really didn't do that at Athens either. I've read different commentaries through the years, and some would say what Paul learned something in Athens so he came to Corinth determined to, to leave some of those things behind him. I don't think that's what's being said here. What Paul did in Athens was he met them where they were and then took them where they needed to be. It's a good lesson for us, by the way, in evangelism. We live, one writer has said, we live very much in the same time frame as what you find in Athens when Paul was there. You know good and well, with some exceptions, if you talk to the younger generation, they will tell you they're very religious, very spiritual. Not very religious, very spiritual. Uh, but they don't want anything to do with your organized religion. They count themselves very spiritual. Now I know there's a growing tide uh, that does not feel that way. And this generation is caught between the interesting uh, confusion of rejecting the Christian gospel while at the same time making way for Islam. It's a fascinating thing to study. Some of the movements on the forefront despise what you and I stand for and who we proclaim. And at the same time, march and protest for the right of Muslims to practice Islam. This is where we live. Very spiritual, despising Christianity. As, as set forth by a white, racist, bigoted misogynists. So we need to learn from Paul at Athens, but really learn it. Everywhere he spoke in Athens, as we were told here, he spoke of Christ crucified and risen. So he says this to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I didn't come trying to impress you with worldly wisdom. I wasn't trying to impress you with even what I knew about God. You see, Corinth 
was also a city influenced by Greek culture, Greek philosophy. And there's a possibility that some in the church in Corinth who had come out of that culture were critical of Paul because he wasn't erudite. He wasn't articulate. How do we know that? Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 5 and 6. Indeed, and remember, almost the entire record of 2 Corinthians is written as a defense of Paul, defending his uh, apostolic authority and his gospel mission. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. That's what he calls the, the group that were following him around, coming into cities after he was there, undermining his ministry. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. So he seems to be responding to some accusations. Paul's not very skilled. And so we, we begin to see from Paul what preaching Christ crucified is not. Brothers and sisters, it is not how clever a speaker is. It's not how he can turn a phrase. It's not how he can, can uh, enthrall you. All those things may have their place, but they do not, they should not overshadow the simple preaching of Christ crucified. In fact, he says that's what preaching the gospel is. Look, verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I made a conscious decision. That's why some authors say that Paul reflected on what happened in Athens and determined not to take that tactic again. I don't, I don't think that's what's happening there. He makes this conscious decision that whatever knowledge you ask him about, he would not allow that to be considered superior knowledge to this, the knowledge of Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is a shame that you can go in churches today and hear sermons on this, that, and the other and not hear the gospel clearly articulated. No one will be saved by learning how to have a happier marriage. No one will be saved by learning how to be a better parent. No one will be saved by whatever felt needs you can bring forth to say this needs to be addressed. The only way people are saved is through the preaching of Jesus Christ who lived a sinless life, who died a vicarious, substitutionary, sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing death on the cross and rose three days later. That is the message. We have no other message. Paul chided the churches in Galatia, remember? Galatians 3.1, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. I preach to you in public, unashamedly, unapologetically, clearly, with conviction that Jesus Christ was crucified. There are people out there that would like for us to believe that really there's not that much difference in, in Islam and Christianity, that we have the same God and on and on and on. Islam rejects the crucifixion of Christ. It has many other troubles. But if it had no other problems, that alone disqualifies it as worthy to be preached or heard by any human being. It cuts out the heart of the message. Liberalism wants to tone it down. Because even today, the idea of God killing his son is offensive to people. The Jews don't believe it because they don't believe Jesus was the Son of God. Non-Jews don't believe it because they, they are so antiseptic in their thinking. The idea of our bloody religion offends them. 
Brothers and sisters, our gospel is a bloody gospel. There's no getting around it. Because here's the deal. My professor Tom Nettles asked this in a forum decades ago when a professor friend of his was going through great lengths to explain how we, how we can still offer Jesus and, and not emphasize the cross as a place where atonement was made for sin. When this fellow got through all of his lectures, I was sitting right next to Tom Nettles. I'll never forget it. He raised his hand. He said, okay, I've heard what you have to say. I have a question, though. Who pays the penalty for my sin? If there's no payment for the penalty of my sin, then I'm still under the wrath of God, guilty of my sin. The cross is very critical. Understanding the cross. Children raised in Sunday school, often I've seen this through the years, what did Jesus do? He died on the cross for our sins. What does that mean? Silence. Sometimes a child will venture forth and say, well, it means he died on the cross for our sins. What does it mean? It means that he, the sinless one, became our substitute. We're sinners. Condemned, unclean. He took our sin. We were deserving of the wrath of God. He took the wrath of God upon himself, satisfied divine justice by his suffering and death in our place. Christ crucified is our message. What Paul said toward the end of Corinthians, we're going to see this more fully, but I just want to read it for you today. 1 Corinthians 15, that chapter where he talks about the resurrection. He says in verse 1, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That's our message. One of the things that I've, that I've searched through my own heart about is when I finish these times with you and I go home and I ask myself, was the gospel presented today? Did I set forth Christ clearly? Because if I didn't, I wasted your time and I offended God. Everything in the Scripture traces itself back to Jesus Christ crucified and risen. We're seeing that in the Old Testament on Sunday nights. You'll begin to see it more in next quarter when, when, there's, when we go through a curriculum that's intentionally designed, the gospel project intentionally designed to magnify the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ throughout all of Scripture. Well, he goes next to say what preaching Christ crucified does not depend upon. He says in verse 3 and Part of verse 4, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. See, what he's not saying there that he's, that he's stupid. Because in Acts 19.80, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. What he is saying is that he didn't try to impress anyone with the wisdom of this world. He didn't try to clean up the cross. He didn't try to tone down the wrath of God. The only way you were saved was to be convinced that you were dead in trespasses and sins, under the wrath of God, deserving of eternal hell. And yet God in His mercy sent Jesus Christ to live and obey the law that you and I did not obey, could not obey, would not obey, and have Jesus in the fullness of time die in your place. You see, if you're not convinced of this message, then being convinced of anything else will not save you. Paul said, I was with you in weakness, in fear and much trembling. People who do not preach and teach don't understand that. 
for the 40 plus years I've preached the gospel, I promise you, I tremble inside at the prospect of bringing reproach to my God and to my Savior. I tremble because it's such a holy message and such a needed message. And people who need it are so desperate for it. And I pray, dear God, don't let me get in the way of the gospel. Set Jesus Christ in the forefront. Paul says, I didn't come to impress you. I didn't come for you to say, wow, that Paul, he really knows his stuff. And that's what they were doing. I follow Paul. Well, I follow Apollos. Well, I follow Peter. So I didn't come to Corinth to impress you. I didn't come to try to argue you into or give, give winsome arguments to convince you of the truthfulness of the gospel. Here's the deal, folks. If I can talk you into being saved, if I can talk you into believing in Jesus crucified and risen, someone smarter, brighter than me can talk you out of it. But if I communicate the message in the power of the Spirit, and the Spirit takes hold of it, and He convinces you in the new birth, enabling you to repent and believe the gospel, coming to dwell in you, to take you safely home to heaven, nobody can take that away from you. Dwight L. Moody told us one time, the great evangelist, he said he was walking down the street and a man walked up to him, clearly intoxicated, and he said, well, Mr. Moody, I'm one of your converts. How do you like that? Moody looked at him and said, you must be one of my converts. Because if you were saved by Jesus Christ, you wouldn't be in the shape you're in. Paul wants them to know he didn't try to impress them. In fact, again in 2 Corinthians, we see this in chapter 10, verse 10. Paul is repeating what people are saying about him. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech of no account. In Galatians 4, 12 to 15, Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also has become, have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, or a messenger there as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Paul is talking there about an eye problem he had. In fact, he says it was his eye problem that caused him to be in the, in the area of Galatia to begin with. He said, my condition was a trial to you. They, they cared for him. But he said, it was only a trial. You loved the gospel so much that you would have torn your own eyes out and given them to me that I might continue with seeing eyes to preach the gospel. You see, the best men are men who know their own weaknesses. And when you stand and preach, this is true of a teacher as well, a teacher who studies during the week to teach has already been taken through the fire of the passage they face before they deliver it. We need to be men and women who never forget what we were. Never forget how marvelous the grace of God has been to us to save us. Self-confidence, arrogance has no place in the life of one who's sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel. In fact, if anything, the more one understands of the glory of God, the more one understands of the magnitude of his or her sin, 
the more one understands of the great work of Jesus Christ, appreciating more and more his perfect life, recognizing more and more how when he died for my sins, the magnitude of that for which he died, the more humility comes, the humbler we should walk. The prophet Micah asked him, what does the Lord require of you? But to practice justice, to love mercy. Not only love being on the receiving end of mercy, but love showing mercy. And to walk humbly before your God. The pre preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ, applied by the Holy Spirit, produces that. In fact, Paul says that he recognized his own tendency to be conceited. In one, in one place in his letters, he goes through his resume and he says, I'm, I'm, if I'm sounding like a fool, I'm talking like a fool for Jesus' sake. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in, my, in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And he learned in that experience as he begged the Lord, Lord, please take this away so I can be more effective for you. He learned from the Lord, my grace, my power is made perfect in your weakness because my grace is sufficient. You don't need this capacity or that capacity. You don't need to deliver from this hindrance or that hindrance. All you need is my grace, and my grace is sufficient. Because when you are weak, when we're, this is the wonderful... Oh, contradiction of the gospel, if you please. The irony of the gospel. That the more assured we become in ourselves, the less useful we are to God. But the more convinced we are of God's grace and our need for His power, and the less we trust in ourselves, the more God finds us worthy of being used. And the fourth thing he says here is, what preaching Christ crucified does absolutely depend upon in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You see, if all you hear is me when I preach, you may pick up a couple of nuggets. I don't do anything original, so if you read it all, you've probably read everything I say anyway. But if in this preaching moment, the Holy Spirit takes over and it moves beyond me and my words and becomes Him and His words. There's lasting power. The demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Every preacher prays for this. Lord, hide me behind the cross. Take my feeble words, my jumbled words, communication and be pleased by your spirit to powerfully apply it in their lives. And I can promise you anything you've ever heard or learned along the way was not because of the vessel you heard it from or learned it from. It's because that is what the spirit took and made stick in your life. And it's a wonderful mercy when he does that. Paul knew that men and women and boys and girls will be convinced by the gospel only as the Spirit demonstrates His power. I'll say it again. You will not be saved because of me. Every now and then you hear somebody say, yeah, brother so-and-so saved me. I cringe when I hear that. No. God may be pleased to use brother so-and-so, But you were saved when the Spirit made the gospel real to you. That's what Paul's saying in Romans when he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on them? On him whom they've not heard. You see, you were saved when you heard Jesus Christ in his Spirit speak to you through the gospel. And those you're praying for to see them saved will be saved the same way. When the Spirit of Jesus Christ speaks through the gospel, 
whether they're hearing it on the spot or whether it's brought to their memory from something they've been taught years ago. It's not an excuse to be lazy. We should study to show ourselves approved. But it's the awareness that nothing that I know just because I know it is necessarily powerful to you. It's only made powerful as the Spirit makes it powerful. Which means you have a responsibility to pray, to prepare yourself to hear the Word of God. Like Spurgeon said, there's more put upon the hearer to prepare his heart to hear than there is upon the preacher to speak. Then finally, the goal of preaching Christ crucified. Here's the bottom line. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Faith that rests in the wisdom of men will, will fizzle at some point because all men will prove themselves foolish at some point. I've watched people through the years who a pastor fell in this area or that area, became a disappointment this way or that way, and their faith was shattered, and they don't go to church anymore. And we're supposed to believe that's normative. That's not normative. What it tells us is that they were dependent upon the power of a man and not the power of God. So that your faith will depend not upon man's wisdom, but upon God's power. I'm going to ask you as we close today, on what have you placed your faith? If you placed your faith in me to deliver, you've missed it. If you place your faith in a Sunday school teacher, if you're placing your faith in a, in, a, in a dad or a mom or just going down the list, someone else, if your faith is in someone else other than Jesus Christ, it will fizzle, believe me. It'll fizzle. A faith that fizzles was false from the first. But if your faith is in Jesus Christ, and preachers can disappoint you, teachers can disappoint you, parents can disappoint you, but Jesus Christ will never disappoint you. All around you can seem to turn itself up as false and hypocritical. Jesus Christ never will. And this is why Paul wanted the Corinthians to know you're wasting your time and energy and bringing reproach upon the gospel to choose your favorite preacher. The message is Christ crucified. And it's not who do you like best that preaches Christ crucified, but who, who do you love most? And it must be Jesus Christ, the only one who died for you and rose again. I pray you know him today. I pray you experience his power in your life. And I pray that you don't get caught up in a party spirit. It was wrecking the church at Corinth. And it threw open the door for all kinds of mischief. But if I believe in Jesus Christ crucified, and you believe in Jesus Christ crucified, and if I long to see the power of God in my life, and you long to see the power of God in your life, and we plead that together, and exhort one another in that together, we will see the power of God come in tremendous demonstration. It's God's way. He doesn't hold back his power from people who need him and long to see him glorified in the advance of the gospel through his church. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we hear this word today. We do not... I don't want to foster uh, preacher worship. We don't depend on anyone else except the shed blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and the Holy Spirit making that real and powerful and transformational in our lives. Oh, God, help us to be followers of Christ. Help us to heed this word today. Help us to make much of the cross, even though people around us will think we're foolish, will think we're, we're out of date, old-fashioned. Oh, God, help us to be convinced that the cross, the message of the cross, never becomes irrelevant because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And we also know it is a great offense to those who are perishing. 
Help us to be faithful, Lord. Help us to make the main thing the main thing. Not get sidetracked with trivialities. But in the days that you have left for us to live and move and have our being in the, in the bounds that you have put around us, oh God, find us faithful to the cross. Faithful to c- proclaim the cross, the resurrection, the gospel, the only hope of sinners, even sinners who initially may reject it. It's still their only hope. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.